just God, it's amazing. Life is just a marathon, so pace it. Rush pain, that thing's hate me, Damon. Life ain't gotta be hard, just keep it basic. Welcome back to Fort Meade Declassified. We're your hosts, Gloria Martin and Chad Jones. And today we have with us U.S. Fleet Cyber Command and U.S. 10th Fleet Command Master Chief Jay Walker. Um, for those of you who don't know, U.S. Fleet Cyber Command and U.S. 10th Fleet Command is a tenant command here on Fort Meade. Um, and they're a vital operational force comprising of over more than 19,000 active and reserve sailors and civilians organized into 26 active commands, 40 cyber mission force units, and 29 reserve commands around the globe. Chief, <laughs> can you just tell us what you do a little bit? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I have the, uh, the privilege of advising the boss on all matters that in, uh, involve enlisted uh, sailors under our, our purview and under our command and control uh, model. And um, the, the, the challenge there is we are the only global fleet, so we have sailors in all 24 time zones and in every domain, whether that's space, air, surface, or subsurface, deployed around the globe 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So one of the things that we get into a lot, because you know part of our job is to reach out and talk to the community about what Fort Meade is. And we, one thing that we tend to use is, you know, we, have a fleet but no ships. What what exactly is a navy fleet? So a navy fleet is a uh, it, it is it is a group of and it depends. It's usually dependent on a, on an area of responsibility. So like third fleet would would be the west coast off of San Diego. Seventh would be Japan. Sixth fleet would be the Mediterranean AOR and so on and so forth. So at tenth fleet we're the uh, the signals intelligence portion of the Navy. That's our fleet area of concentration, which is what makes us the global fleet. Right, and that's what we were, so, because there was a little bit of back and forth between 10th Fleet and Fleet Cyber. So Fleet Cyber, you cover the entire Navy. Correct. There, there's cyber requirements and for the entire Navy, not just a specific region. Correct. And How is it to be a Navy fleet on an Army fort? It's How awesome. Work out? Really? Yeah, I love it. I love really? It. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm all about the joint fight, and uh, you know, it, it, in any um, any war that I think that we'll ever get into, it's going to be a joint fight. I think mm -hmm. history has told us that. Uh, the quicker we become more purple, and, and I mean, you know, all of us coming together, understanding what each other does, how we all fit into that is extremely important. So I, being stationed here, we've got Mar Force Cyber, we've got, you know, a, an Air Force footprint, we even have a Coast Guard footprint, and then being on the Army, the Army Garrison, with just uh, fantastic support, quite frankly, from uh, leadership on the Garrison side, whether it's, you know, housing or medical, what, what be it, has just been, a, it, it's amazing, I love it, I'm a big fan, so... Is this your first time here at Fort Meade? Fort Meade, yeah, but I grew up in an army town. So. Okay, which one? Fort Stewart. Okay. Oh. <laughs> so what are the new ones? We, we changed the name oh, Fort the Stewart. We designated ones. Yeah, one of the, okay. Yeah, yeah did, did you have to go through that with the Navy? Redesignate any of your, uh, your well, it's not an installation, it's a... The naval bases. Did you have to redesignate any of your bases? Not naval bases, I'm aware of, but we have went back and renamed several of our ships. Yeah. A lot of our cruisers were named after, uh, our guided missile cruisers were named after uh, Civil War battles, so whether north or south, but a lot of the, the ones that were on the Confederate side, we went back and renamed. And you're, you're a senior NCO. How long have you been in? Uh, 27, going on 28 years. 27, yeah. Gosh, that's a long time. <laughs> it's always in intelligence, or...? Uh, <clears throat> so came in by trade. I was a, a radio man. Um, a few years after that, they merged us and, and uh, with a couple of other different MOSs. We call them ratings in the Navy. Renamed to information systems technician. So I was a information systems technician until about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, when I went into command master chief program. Outstanding. So do you come from an Army family, or? I do not. Okay. No, my, uh... Uh, my mom and dad were both educators and I uh, got offered a job up at Fort Stewart, so we moved when I was 14 from a very small town in South Georgia. So. Oh, okay. so you're the first one in the Navy? Well, my dad was in during Vietnam. Um, my grandfather, uh, so my dad, not to get too much off track here, my dad was adopted, found my his, his biological parents uh, through DNA, 
and um, come to find out my grandfather was actually in the Navy and flew PBYs out of uh, Barron Field in South Florida during World War II, and now my son's in the Navy, so. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's amazing sometimes just how you can track lineage back through you know, the military seems to stick together. Where right. Whether you go in, there, there's never just seems to be one. Yeah. Yeah. It's a family business. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so speaking of business in here at the, you know, the Navy, um, what are some of the challenges? You know, one of the things we talk about is that our service members, unlike other places where you deploy somewhere and you do your wartime mission, our service members end up doing a lot of their wartime missions here at Fort Meade. Right. Do you see that? Is that is that your case with, with Fleet Cyber? Not always, because we do have such a, a diverse group of sailors here. Yeah. Um, I think what kind of gets uh, uh, lost a little bit is, is some of our cyber mission absolutely takes place here. But we've got everything that supports that. And then we've also got sailors over some of our units that actually do deploy, and I mean deploy a lot. So um, when I say deploy a lot, I mean 365 days plus out of two years they'll be deployed supporting missions forward, whether that's surface, subsurface, or in the air. Um, and the more global events that are going on, the, the higher that op tempo comes for us. So do you all have like a uh, family readiness group or whatever the naval component is here? We do. We absolutely do. What, yeah. what do they do? So we have, in the Navy, we call it a Fleet and Family Support Center. Yep. And um, they offer services to our service members that are, uh, you know, local on base. And they can do financial counseling. They can do uh, marriage counseling, child, you know, counseling for children, especially little, little, little guys and gals. Uh, when mom or dad goes down range and they don't kind of understand what's going on, they provide those services for us. Uh, they can, got a junior sailor that wants to buy a car and, and, They've got classes for that, or uh, we run a million dollar uh, sailor class with BRS and TSP and this kind of thing. They teach them very young sailors about investment opportunities, you know, compounding interest and how these things work and um, how to set themselves up for success in the future, whether that's in or out of the military. So, cool. okay. yeah, that sounds like a great resource. Could you tell us more about the relationship between Fleet Cyber and Fort Meade? Yeah, absolutely. I um, so. Our relationship with them is, is we've got our, a lot of our families here. Our fleet and family service uh, center resides on Fort Meade. Uh, we've got, you, know, you you talked about how the number of sailors we have inside our claimancy, and we've got about 3,300 of those reside actually in the Fort Meade area with their families. So the relationship is not only, you know, you think housing and commissary and bowling alleys and these, these sorts of NWR things, but also medical uh, care for our families, even though we are close to Annapolis and there's a lot of other things inside the DHA. Kimbro provides a, a significant resource for our folks, whether that's actual medical, dental, mental health type things. Um, the exchange has a lot of services that are available. I mean, you do, we've got optometry in there, the pharmacy, docs, dental just opened, and there's a big resource for our families to go into. So. There's a lot of things on the base that really support our family, and we're super appreciative for that. Which does make, I mean, so there are more sailors on Fort Meade than there are soldiers. True. Which, you know, that, that impacts us when we're talking with the Army <laughs> about, we only got 4,000 soldiers, well, yeah, we got, you know, even more sailors than that. Hi, Chuck Yang here. In November, we celebrate Native American heritage by educating ourselves on the history and contributions of indigenous people. U.S. declared November a historic month for the indigenous community in 1990, when then President George H.W. Bush approved a joint resolution establishing November as National Native American Heritage Month. Come out celebrate with Fort Meade on Thursday, 16 November at Club Meade. Now back to the conversation. So just yesterday we had our annual Army Navy flag football game. Oh, we did. Yeah, and the Navy has not beaten the Army here, even with your superior numbers since like <laughs> 2005. So do you not give time for football PT or you know, maybe you guys riding too tight of a ship? I guess. <laughs> to... uh, 
I, I'm not. I'm not a hundred percent certain. I know Warfare Group Six had a big footprint out yeah. yesterday, and I was actually uh, right before I came here. I was talking with uh, Command Master Chief Kim Ferguson over at CWG Six yeah. about their uh, their their loss yesterday. So to see, because that is when we normally talk Navy, we've talked more about fleet cyber in the last few years as right. the expanded. But so the CWG Cryptologic Warfare Group Six, which I think is probably the coolest sounding organization <laughs> on Fort Meade. It used to be something not nearly as cool. But do they fall under you? Do they have a similar mission set, or how how does that relationship work? So we're the operational headquarters for. Cyber Warfare Group 6, and then under them, they've got several other uh, subordinate commands that are very specialized in what they do, whether that's, you know, surface or uh, forward deployed or strike activities or, you know, defenders, mm -hmm. depending on what the mission set is. They've got, you know, subordinate commands that specialize in certain areas. Nice. Thank you. Um, could you share some recent success stories or achievements of Fleet Cyber? In the realm of cybersecurity and information warfare? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, a big part of what we have is our reserve component here. Um, we've actually got a ton of reservists in the area. So, and this weekend I'm actually, uh, Saturday afternoon I get the, the opportunity to go out and have a, we call them an all hands call with our reserve component command. And I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that. But they run an operation uh, every year called Cyber Dragon. And what Cyber Dragon is, <clears throat> is they go out and look at our networks, find uh, where we're missing patches and apply those patches. How to, it's hardening the network, and we as this has evolved over and over, and we've done it multiple times now. Uh, we're really reducing uh, the attack surface that uh, an adversary could have to get into our networks, and it's proven wildly successful for us. So, and that would be impossible to do without our our reserve component as well. So, and then. Well, it is amazing how much reserves are tied into all of our forces now. To Absolutely. And how that works. I mean, I know we have like 200 MP command off post here too, and they just, you know, it's almost like a active unit. Um, I do want to ask a little bit, because as we go through larger community, and I know, so and I talked to your public affairs, uh, Denver, yes. Lou Haynes, we, she used to work in my <laughs> office. Um, but one area where we discussed a little bit and I think that hits the fort as a whole especially with you know cyber and intelligence is outreach into the community to a share what your missions are but really you know getting out into the schools to hopefully you know attract the workforce of the future do you do uh, fleet cyber have those type of activities uh, we do we've got a uh, so any sort of community relation projects that we have uh, Fleet Cyber does that. Cyber Warfare Group 6 does. A lot of our subordinate commands under them have community outreach projects. Uh, they just did the, the uh, event over at the elementary school here at yep. me. There's a lot of that going on. Our recruiters are really getting in. We're, we're starting to develop the MICWO or the Maritime Cyber Warfare Operator Program. Uh, we're looking at getting cyber warfare engineers, which are just some of the most brilliant human beings on the face of the planet that come in and do really, really great work for us. Uh, the Naval Academy is starting to pull a lot of these folks in and, and get, uh, you know, that course of curriculum up for us. Just so there's a lot of outreach, a lot of STEM programs. Uh, we've got a lot of commissioning programs from within. So our cyber warrant uh, uh, warrant officer program is starting to get reinvigorated now, where we can we can bring people from the enlisted pay grades into the warrant program uh, to do that mission for us. And then there's a ton of other commissioning programs available available to us in the Navy to get folks from enlisted pay grades, if that's what they want to do, to a commission. And then we're going out to ROTC units and, uh, you know, the academy and, yeah. and trying to to pull talent from there as well. That's very, it's very interesting. But, it, I mean, it's just amazing how, especially here, Talent and quality of life, everything seems to come down to that, that you have to attract and retain talent, and a big part of that is quality of life, but it's also just developing the mission and the skill sets to be able to do that. Do you all, I guess I'll get a little, per so my daughter's boyfriend is in the cyber program over at the academy now. Nice. Um, 
So, and I think he's actually probably coming over for a summer to spend the summer with you all. But congrats. Um, how how does that relationship work? I mean, as you're going in and you're getting the new officers, how how does that work in in pulling them in and into this career field? Is it now something that you know you can get it right from a flu, you know right from a lieutenant or right from a private? Well, E one seaman, you know E one yeah. where you can get into the cyber and your type of you know, and I guess space, that's one other thing we need to talk yeah. about a little bit, that you can get that right from the jump, or do you have to get, right, like, you came in at one thing and then you moved up into this? Right. How, how does that work? Yeah, so our recruiters go out to the field, and, yeah, to answer the, the short answer is yes. You can come straight in as a cyber warfare technician. So we go out and we recruit these people. If they have the, the required ASVAB scores or, you know, the arms service yep. location I have two battery if they've got the required scores then we'll absolutely bring them in we'll give them a couple more exams uh, much like our our nuclear trained sailors they come in that run our nuclear reactors on our carriers they give them another exam on top cool. of the ASVAB and they say okay yep you've got the you've got the aptitude for this career field um, and then we'll start start them in training right after boot camp wow we I was talking to the army recruiters about some cyber and they mentioned that ex that uh, earlier or that additional exam mm -hmm. and they were finding out that students were not even prepared or even knew that that was something they were going to have to do in the recruiting process so I know we're reaching out with Anne Arundel County Schools at least at a local level to hopefully start preparing because apparently people ask hey can I get into cyber and then they're just finding out that they're not necessarily they have not received all the preparation needed to get into the field because it is um, space yeah, isn't that that's one of the other things you all do? Yeah, it is. It is. Um, so Navy Space just just became a thing here this year in January, and uh, when it was finally signed out, stood up as a, as part of our our uh, portfolio of things we're responsible for. We're starting to build the manpower into that. Uh, it'll it'll take us a few years to get uh, you know fully funded and manned and staffed to where we need to be. But uh, we are the Navy's component for Navy Space or for Space Command out in Colorado. I'm gonna. So and Brian, who's in here, he's our Air Force guy, and he's like, "Oh, Air Force is space." Um, but I guess the question: what What is the nexus between Navy and space? I mean, those seem like two of the most separated domains possible so they are so i will uh when i was out at, at spacecom uh for a c-cell offsite a, a few months ago and i gave a i gave a presentation about navy space and what we do and we're more of a supporting component right now in layering effects and, and that kind of thing of what we can do in space but the space is nothing new to the navy really hmm. um you know if you look at a map of the pacific ocean it turns out it's a, it's a pretty darn big place. So in order to move, <laughs> really? oh yeah. So in order to move tons of data across the largest body of water <clears> on the planet, um, you know, HF is about the only thing. High frequency is about the only thing that will get you there, uh, but not a lot of data on that path. So in order to move large amounts of data outside of a terrestrial, um, you know, method, some sort of a fiber optic line. Satellite links are the way we do it in the Navy, and we've done it for years and mm. years and years. So it's a, we actually have a major comm stay out, our communication station out in uh, Hawaii that is, is, you know, it does a lot of the satellite relay for us and, and command and control for our communications. I should have thought of that. So in addition to the things that you've talked about, community relations, recruiting, Navy space, yep. what are other key priorities and initiatives that Fleet Cyber is focusing on the next few years? Uh, so first and foremost is uh, recruiting and retaining talent. Um, there's a, Cyber is, you know, it, the, the demand signal from the civilian sector and the compensation that they can offer is, is significant compared to what we can but we can offer you a mission set we can offer you things that that uh, you know serving your nation that that they can't be some of the other uh, I don't want to say challenges but things we're working towards especially is zero trust so zero trust networks are are it because it, it, it makes a significant challenge for an adversary 
uh, to get into the network. I mean, my God, it, it makes it hard for us to get in under zero trust under some time. So an adversary, it's it surely thwarts it. And if you're not familiar with zero trust, it means I don't believe you yeah. are who you say you are. So you have to prove an authentication method to access any resource inside the network. And it, it makes it very hard to move around and, and get places and that you shouldn't be. Mr. Chief Walker, is there anything else that you want people to know about Fleet Cyber or 10th Fleet or Navy Space? Uh, that we're hiring. We're always looking for good talent. So if you're interested, by all means, uh, we advertise on USA Jobs and, and other platforms out there. We've got a we've got a significant social media presence. So um, we're always uh, looking for for great talent people who want to serve the nation and, and true patriots that want to go forward and help defend and, and operate our networks. Uh, and then lastly, I, I, would, I would just say that we all own a piece of this, whether you're a civilian or a military, if you're at home, make sure your networks are patched, make sure your antivirus yeah. software is up to date. Man, it's little things you can do to really minimize that attack surface that an adversary has to get into your own network. Um, don't click on links you don't know. I saw an article, I forget where it was, this was a, a week or so ago, that said upwards of 90% of all network attacks are from spear phishing. Where Still. You, yeah, where you get an email, and uh, we could talk about that for days, some of the, the <laughs> silliness that goes on, but um, almost 90% of them come from, you know, you get an email and you think it's legitimate, click the link, and it's, uh, you know, it's right. not what you believe it is. So. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, this is awesome. Thank yeah. you for the invite. I really appreciate How it. How can people stay connected with Fleet Cyber? Uh, we, like I said, we have a huge social media footprint out there. Our PAO is, is really good at getting that information uh, updated, Re especially when we recognize our, our great civilian sailors, reservists, um, you know, whether that's a, a, of the quarter or some sort of of the year recognition, some sort of uh, Heritage Month celebration, they're they're fantastic at pushing that stuff out. So. Oh yeah, and before we even go on that. So, so every year we talk a little bit about Army Navy. Yes. Are you do you direct or are you already plotting to like sabotage <laughs> Colonel Saps off? I mean there was a long tradition where, you know, pre COVID where the Navy was fairly creative, whether it was barbecues in front of the commander's house. One year, I think there was a fifteen hundred balloons in his office. I mean, do you are you thinking about that yet, or did I just at least plan? I mean, the fourth was funner. I wasn't when, when you I am now. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out, Colonel Sapp. I'll get with Sergeant Major Welch. We'll make it happen. There we go. I'll get him in cahoots with us. There it is. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It was fantastic. It. Yeah. All right. Well, remember to say. Connected with Fort Meade on our social media and the Digital Garrison app for the latest installation updates. Whether you're listening or watching, thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time on Fort Meade Declassified.